We will call to order the regular board meeting for the Chicago Board of Election Commissioners. Good morning. My name is Maris Samuel Hernandez. I'm the chairwoman. Seated to my right is Commissioner William Cressy and to my left is Commissioner Jonathan Swain. Next item on the agenda is the consideration of the agenda. Are there any suggestions for edits? If not, we'll proceed to the approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting of September 12, 2017. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes and the minutes are approved. We also have the minutes of the special board meeting of September 19, 2017. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion. It passes and the minutes of September 19, 2017 are approved. Next is the Executive Director's Report, Mr. Bob. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm passing out reports to the board members. We had our first phase one meeting on Tuesday, October 3rd, to talk about the RFPs that were submitted on new voting equipment. You can see on the second page, that's the evaluation committee that we have for. And as you can see, there are some non-voting members that happen to be one of them. Uh, we have the stack of RFPs is about that high. I'd like to get permission to send soft copies. Do you want it emailed to you or do you want it on a memory stick? Yeah. Um, six. Sticks? Sticks. Sticks. Okay. Um, you will have a non disclosure uh, document that we'll send with that. So I just want you to be aware of it. Um, Morel had all the materials put together, did an excellent job. We should be, um, hopefully, in another two weeks, if everybody can go through these proposals, come up with the top three, and then we will uh, issue a report to the board members but it seems to be going quite well. Uh, I also have uh, a executive session today on personal matters, if I could have the board members. But that's all I have for the board at this time. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Mr. Bell. Uh, next is uh, Mr. Allen, our communications director. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, briefly, the... Uh, We'll follow through on uh, I'm sorry. news releases regarding. I'm sorry. Can I interrupt? I'll go ahead. Jim Allen for one second. Barry Taylor for the quick report. He's here to give a oh, quick report. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry Barry. No problem. I'll be sure. Good morning. Um, as you know, Equip for Equality is working with the Board of Elections on accessibility polling places, and we wanted to give you our monthly update. Um, we are now in the process of reviewing all of the polling place surveys and uh, determining what temporary permanent fixes can be made and whether or not there are certain polling places that just cannot be made accessible in a reasonable manner and we'll have to identify new polling places. We've um, I finished our work on a third of the polling places and sent those over to the Board of Elections to work, move forward with implementation. And uh, our deadline is the end of this month, so we're finishing the review of a lot of the other ones and we'll be sending those over on a rolling basis. Uh, and then, as you know, we want to try to get as many of those implemented for the March primary and then ultimately uh, for the November election in the fall. So that's the latest um, on our work there. Any questions? Just to add to it, at the end of the month when we get the reports, we will then be meeting with uh, city agencies who uh, have a lot of these polling places, schools, park districts, so we'll be meeting with them at the end of this month. <coughs> we've been prioritizing the, the city agencies as mm -hmm. we've been going through since those are the ones that uh, can be moved forward quickly. Okay. <coughs> Just offhand, what percentage of our polling places are controlled by city agencies? Uh, schools, we're doing about uh, two, 30 percent for schools. We have another ten park districts. I mean, it's in the fifty percent, roughly fifty. So we have fifty-five percent taken care of right there. Yeah. Thank you. Libraries, all of them. And what, and what happens in the case of private polling places where there's some deficiencies? It's a conversation with that individual property owner? It's with the property owner. Now, some of these can be cured with signage. But, I mean, just some common sense alternate entrances. Other ones, if the proprietor would like to uh, make the 
place that 100 percent accessible will give them what information of how to do that but they're not forced to so i so i'm thinking catholic schools in particular right where you have a there's probably you're probably more likely to have some some issues that are not science related right. stairs things of that nature right. yeah. um have we had any conversation with them at all? Or, or do, yes, they, do they represent a, a, a large portion enough to have a conversation with them? We have, I, I do meet with, I sit on the Board of Catholic Charities and I do meet with a, a lot of them. So, yes, they understand. Okay. We'll be sit, having a further meeting with them. And if they don't, and if the owner does not, at their, it'll be at their expense, correct? Yes, it would. And if it, they don't agree, then we have to move we the polling places? Move, move the polling places, yes. I mean, these entities, some of them are not the private churches, but these entities do have responsibilities outside of being a polling place for accessibility. So hopefully they will see that it's not only needs to be made accessible for election day, but also throughout the year for folks who access their, their facilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, uh, briefly, uh, we are following up on, uh, we follow up rather, on both of the news releases that we discussed earlier one related to National Voter Registration Day, uh, having to do with uh, automatic registration not likely being operational until uh, sometime after January 2019 at the state level. Uh, and secondly, on the materials available to campaigns and uh, political organizations uh, as they prepare to file petitions. So both of those are posted in uh, various locations on the website, uh, as well as distributed different community press and uh, major media as well, but we focused on commu community organizations and community press. Uh, secondly, we've been uh, following up on the canvas. Uh, we're probably going to have uh, upward of 175,000, more than the amount that uh, we had originally. So now it's a matter of securing uh, the last pieces of the job. Uh, and thirdly, been working with Mr. Pacho on various budget uh, documents and budget preparations, particularly with the city, but we have also uh, more work to go with the county. The county has been uh, slower to try to get everything going because they've been tackling with uh, some other financing issues lately. That's it. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll proceed to all business infrastructure projects and changes in election administration um, and voting equipment, which I think we have tackled. Yes, we have. And um, electronic projects, do we have anything? No further update right now. Um, and uh, uh, Mr. Laskin, legislation, is there anything? What I'd like to discuss with you today is just some of the ideas that I've been talking about with various people in the agency uh, to develop a legislative agenda for the board for mm -hmm. 2018. Just run over some of those ideas now we'll, for you to be aware of and we'll talk more about it as we keep moving forward. Um, one, one issue that we would like to push, and there's a lot of, uh, it sounds like there's a lot of support in the agency for it, is the idea of universal vote centers. Prior uh, General Counsel Jim Scanlon has provided you with memos. He's even drafted sort of a proposed bill. That is something, frankly, that has such benefits both to the voters and to the taxpayers who have to fund the elections uh, in a large place like Chicago that I, you know, I, my personal belief is we should push for that until we get it. Um, but that's one thing we're considering still. Also, uh, there was a recent change in the, in the law on early voting, and it expanded the early voting time out to 40 days. And it's my understanding that the number 40 appeared in that statute literally as a typo. Uh, but then it got approved, and now nobody wants to change it because they would look as though they're trying to cramp early voting. It's very difficult for us, though, to maintain early voting for 40 days in our consolidated election cycle. There may not even be 40 days between the consolidated primary and the consolidated election. So it's not even feasible in a situation like that. And we certainly want to provide ample early voting uh, opportunities for people, but uh, we'd like to push to decrease that 40 days, preferably back down to something more manageable like 15 or, or 20, except perhaps maybe for the general elections, the even year November elections. We can still feasibly do a 40 day uh, early voting cycle. But with the push towards vote by mail, uh, we also thought that we could include an, uh, those universal vote centers, uh, drop boxes for 
vote by mail ballots to make it easier for you to, without even having to find postage, submit those ballots all throughout the city. As we keep making those pushes to make it easier to vote in alternative methods, a longer early voting period may not even be all that necessary because we've made it so easy for people to vote over such a long period of time <coughs> in different manners. Um, let me uh, ask you, <clears throat> in terms of uh, approaching uh, the legislature on reducing the 40-day period, um, have we, uh, do we have a sense of other jurisdictions would join us? Yes, it's okay. unanimous. Okay. So we could present a We think that the, there's a, a, a good consensus that the expansion that large is the, the benefit to the public does not outweigh the cost to the public. We certainly want to give early voting a good block of time, but I think there's a lot of support behind the idea of tailoring this, this typoed legislation mm -hmm. back to where it should be. Well, do we have an idea what the number was supposed to be before this scrivener's error? It wasn't supposed to change from 15 to 40. 40 is, uh, is like some kind of biblical Hold on number. Now. Yeah. Right. So it, what, what happened was a cut and paste situation with uh, in-person vote by mail uh, legislation being copied and pasted into the separate uh, section uh, having to do with early voting when they were revamping that. So uh, we had, as a board, lobbied for successfully, moving it from 22 days before to 15 days before, and we had unanimous support when we did that uh, among the county clerks around the state because 22 days before, especially in a primary or a municipal election, people don't have their minds made up. Really, early voting is a function of minds made up. For a general election, 22 days works out great. Even 30 days works out great because many people are ready to vote as soon as the conventions are over presidential election but yeah 15 for most other elections is where you really see the increase in usage <coughs> and before that your opening sites and staffing sites for virtually no one to come in uh, at all these locations across the city so uh, so we're going <coughs> to go back to 15 or 22? 15 or 22 uh, would be a great compromise but 40 is totally unworkable in a municipal election when we're still going to be in court yeah, don't remember the ballot certification deadline is 68 days before, and we are so frequently still dealing with electoral board decisions on judicial review or in the appellate courts up to 40 days, 30 days. Not out, to mention so. the personnel costs that would be about oh, astronomical. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 51 sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's yeah. Astronomical. So that, so with respect to a municipal election, uh, clearly that cannot be adhered to by the schedule. But would that be a cause of action for any candidate, the fact that we did not, the law says 40 days? It would be a cause of action, but I do believe that when a law creates something that's impossible, sure. the courts recognize that, and they recognize that if we have to start early voting before the primary, I mean, how do sure. we I got prepare you. a ballot? So I guess yeah. the, point, the reason I ask that question is because if there has not been uh, any movement with respect to the 40 days, one compromise might be for, for and a practical impossibility, like our municipal elections, to clear that up, to yeah. avoid that particular issue, and then doing approaching it in some kind of incremental fashion. So if they don't want to move on the 40, then at least move on this because it's imp impossible to do. At least for the consolidated cycle. Right. right. We'll, right. we'll take what we can get, but right. we're, we're going to push for, mm -hmm. for, for what we can get. Now, the, the State Board of Elections has proposed some changes about write-in voters that uh, we are in, internally at least in support of. Uh, right now, to be a write-in voter, in some offices you'd have to file a declaration of intent with multiple election authorities uh, if you're in a district that is under the jurisdiction of multiple election authorities. It gets complicated for the write-in voters. The state board is proposing uh, a change to the law so that you only would file one declaration of intent to be a write-in. You would file it with the same office where the nomination petitions for that same office would have been filed. And then that election authority, let's say it's a state representative district, you would file your write-in with the state board of elections, if it's a state uh, if it's a state rep district that hits Chicago and suburban Cook County, then the state board of elections would transmit to us a certification of that write-in, and would also transmit it to the county, or maybe they would transmit it to the county, and then the county would transmit it to us. But uh, the idea is make that a little bit easier for the write-in voters. 
while we're at it, we would throw into that uh, some minor changes to the filing times that are current for uh, write-ins. Right now, the standard deadline is 61 days before the election. We think that should be brought out to 68 days before the election because that's the ballot certification deadline. If someone does file a write-in, we need to get that line put on the ballot. So it's unfortunate that they could, under the law right now, file seven days after we've finalized our ballots and all of a sudden we have to go put some more lines on. The other timing issue is that if a candidate was removed from the ballot by an electoral board, that candidate can file a write-in declaration up to seven days before the election, which is quite unfeasible in a lot of situations. We would propose changing that rule so that they could file their write-in declaration within seven days after the electoral board removed them or the circuit court removed them on judicial review or the appellate court and so forth. At least just trying to bring that as far away from the election as possible to make it easier to manage. The second proposal by the State Board of Elections is to uh, amend the election code allowing an electoral board to have jurisdiction over the filing of write-in declarations. Uh, right now there's not a clear statutory method Someone can go into the courthouse and file a circuit court a mandamus action to try to tell us what to do in relation to what they believe would be an insufficient, legally insufficient right in declaration. Our proposal is let the electoral boards have jurisdiction over that so that we have it all contained in this, all ballot access contained in the same venue. And also, similarly with the candidate petitions, then also to allow the agency to use its apparent conformity authority for things that are filed outside of the deadline or if it's not signed or you know, something rather apparent. So that's what we're pushing for right now, open for more ideas as we start moving into 2018. I think all of those are great ideas. Um, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, we will proceed with new business and there is an attorney uh, contract or agreement. The board and uh, Ms. Barbara Goodman that we have before us, and as everybody knows, Ms. Goodman has been a long time hearing officer of the board, um, and uh, she uh, will again provide those uh, services in relation to the 2018 primary and general elections. Uh, in addition, uh, she has uh, served as an assistant to the general counsel here during the electoral board seasons, and she will again provide those services for the 2018 cycle. Um, and uh, we all acknowledge that uh, she is a very important part uh, of the, uh, will be, of the has been and will continue to be uh, an important part of the uh, 2018 elections. Um, <clears throat> so, um, there is uh, before us an attorney contractor agreement between the Board of Election Commissioners and Barbara Goodman for the period of time of October 10, 2017 through December 31st, 2018, um, at the rate of uh, $200 per hour. Um, is, uh, does anyone have any questions? If not, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes, and uh, the attorney contractor agreement between the board and this party is approved. Madam Chair, the next item I'd like to pull off the video, if you don't mind. Sure. I will be, uh, I will be sending information okay. by the end of this week. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, next item on the agenda is a legal report. Mr. Lasker, is there anything? There's not a legal report, although, as you uh, know, I've requested an executive session for pending mm -hmm. litigation. That's fine. Uh, there is no financial report. Uh, <coughs> there is uh, no public comment. And so. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, just Can two you questions. Uh, take your name, please. Yeah, Dr. Laura Chamberlain, Clean Count Cook County. Um, uh, Mr. Allen, you said that there were 175,000 more canvas returns than you thought? No. Or that you, can you no, give us the total? We're going to be over the 175,000, is what I was getting. Okay, so that's the total, is over uh, 175. Probably closer to 200,000. Okay, okay, great. And um, Mr. Lasker, 
I wanted to, about the uh, your intentions for possible uh, legislation, um, the candidate would file one motion of intent for a write-in at the State Board of Elections, and then the election board would actually adjudicate it, right? Would it decide whether they were it depend, authorized? It would depend on the office. If the office is one, is a state office where the nominating petitions are filed with the state board, then a writing candidate for that office would file a declaration with the state board. Okay. If you're running for Chicago alderman, you would file your nomination petitions with us, and therefore also your declaration of intent to be writing would get filed with us. Right. So that's... Depended on the race, okay, yeah. great. And then, um, how long would the election jurisdiction have to decide on? Depends on when the writing is filed, uh, because... I mean, how many days after filing? Oh, you're right, because there would, there would be a deadline. Okay. It's so. always going to be expedited. The electoral board will always act as quickly as it can. It would be the same as with candidates, except for that with candidates, there's just a seven-day period. We know they're going to be filing their petitions. Right. With the write-in, we don't quite know when it's going to come in, but I think that the proposal is that the same five-day period after the filing to create the objection would exist. And then the electoral board would probably follow the same timeline to initiate the hearings because it's already a pretty a busy timeline for what has to happen behind the scenes to right. get the notices out and so forth. And, and the electoral board would act as quickly as it can. Okay. And, per, and hopefully 61 days before the ballots are, before the election day. We'd like to make it 68. 68. Because that's the same deadline as ballot certification, which, as I pointed out, then if we, if we there's no blank line unless someone files a declaration to be a write-in. Right. Then we'd have to put that, add that blank line. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> um, next on the item is uh, executive session. And um, is there a motion to go into executive session for discussion of pending litigation uh, in accordance with Section 2C11 of the Open Meetings Act and discussion of external auditing committees? under Section 2C29 and personnel matters under Section 2C1. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, so uh, motion passes. We will now go into executive session. Uh, we will not take any action in executive session um, and we will return if there, uh, if there needs to be any action taken. We will take that in open session upon our return. Okay. We're back now in uh, open session. Uh, the board took no action in executive session. Uh, and, uh, if there is nothing further, no further business, then um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do you want to say when we adjourn to? Um, Okay, we will uh, post the. Uh, the okay, sounds good to me. Okay, so moves. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. We're adjourned. Thank you.